Kenna, that was outstanding. We're going to stand and sing 572, America the Beautiful. who understand what freedom under God means. And there have been those who gave their all. I love the words of this song because it asks God to mend our every flaw. It acknowledges that we are imperfect as a nation. We acknowledge that we are imperfect as people and we pray to God, if there be any wicked way in me, then show it to me and get rid of it, Lord. There have been those who've given their all. We remember them today. And when the enemy seeks to destroy us from within, we have to understand what's at stake. To paint this country as system, systemically evil in an attempt to tear it completely down and then rebuild it in the image of, of those who don't believe in God and don't trust in God is evil and wrong. And we have to be careful. We have to stand up as God's people and understand the wrongs that have happened. And, and own wrongs and, and make sure wrongs are right and all those things. We're not ignoring the wrongs, but all that is right and good, Satan would seek to destroy 
by bringing up our past. And please understand what's at stake. Men have stood and taken arms for this country and have died for what this country stands for. Do not let it go. Honor them with your patriotism in all the right ways. One nation under God. Amen. We are so blessed. We have been so blessed. And the enemy will steal our, our blessing as a nation. The enemy has stolen it from others in our nation. And we want to make sure they enjoy the same liberties that all men enjoy. Whatever background they are, whatever color they are, whatever race, whatever background we come from, we are a melting pot, aren't we, under God. And we're so thankful. Rise up, men of God. Rise up, church of God, and defend this great country. Defend this great country. We thank God for those who gave their physical lives for this great country. That's what this weekend's about. It's not to have a day off or to have a picnic. Those are all great things. It's, it's a day to remember those who paid the ultimate price in the armed services of this country. And we want to remember them today. And we love our veterans. We got several of those scattered. But we're remembering those who gave the ultimate price. Our veterans were willing to do that. But we honor today those who gave the ultimate price for this country. Live out those freedoms. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your presence. Thank you for this great country. We, we are true uh, patriots when we understand the principle of the goodness of America. And if we understand it, we want it extended to everyone in this country. And we ask for that, Lord. We don't want to take it away. We want to make it available to everyone. Because your goodness and your grace and when we live and do things your way, it's so obvious, it's so good, and it brings all those good things that come from you. And we acknowledge you as the source of all good things. Thank you for those who are so passionate about what America stands for, that they're willing to shed their blood to give their lives. And Father, as they have given their lives for earthly freedom, we know that you gave your life for our spiritual and eternal freedom, far more important. But Father, thank you that your gospel has a place here. Your gospel has been spread from here. We thank you that we have a missionary here today that was, was brought to Christ through American missions. And we pray, Father, your blessing on him as he comes later. Bless this service, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. May be seated. First, I want to get welcome and announcements out of the way. We have lots of stuff going on today, and I'm excited about it. This is a special day, and I am so pleased with all of you here on Memorial Day weekend. There are so many people that have so many other things on their mind. When you have God on your mind, and, and you have country under God on your mind, and I'm so thankful you're in this place today. I believe God will bless you for it as we look to Him. Do we have any special announcements? I know something special happens a week from today. We leave for church camp. Exciting times. Y'all pray that the preacher for senior camp would be ready. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I'll add to that. Uh, next week, we'd like to feed the campers, the adults and the campers going. So we're going to do Good. a sandwich lunch for the kids and the adults are going uh, so that nobody has to leave the church until the bus leaves. So Great. Uh, next Sunday for the campers and the adults going. Thank you for that. We appreciate it. Cindy. Yes, Jerry. Uh, I got an email from uh, Ken Martin who is over the share center for the women who are having pregnancies and the fathers and all that they do there in the Florida. They're going to open up now the tickets to be purchased if you want to go to the Baptist church and have a celebration of life. And if you do go and you purchase tickets to sit at a table, they do want you to provide a donation because this is a dinner and it's really important. And so please, we would love to have the representation from our church. So I will be sending that email out to all of you. So that's what that's about. So we 
we get that, it's a, a great opportunity. And we still have our our bottles back there if you want to bottle, so we got change, money, tip, whatever you like. They <laughs> would love to appreciate the donation. It is a great cause. This is an amazing thing that they do there. They, they keep their The other thing I want to say is we you are in for a treat. If you are here the Sunday after <coughs> camp, not only to hear the testimonies of the children who have gone and camp counselors, but our choir, our young kids choir, our youth choir will be performing. And it is a blessing. Come that Sunday. <laughs> Amen. One more real fast. Sure. Ladies, remember Wednesday is our arts and crafts meeting at ten o'clock. All right, ladies, anything else? Yes, Chris. We've all been blessed over time with just one example of the other of the mother's English love. Today, I got to meet Linda's son for the first time. And I cannot tell you the number of prayers that she has grown up and to enjoy such blessed future prospects for my next son. Amen. Amen. Welcome, young man. Welcome. Praise, praise and glory to God, right? Amen. Georgie. I just want to let y'all know I, I found St. Jude's Ranch. I'm looking for you. Let me know if you need to get there. <laughs> <laughs> They were extremely happy with what I gave them. We gave them. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not taking donations and clothing and everything, but uh, the beds in the back, stuff like that. And I, anyways, I am. They asked me, and I'm thinking very seriously of maybe doing a class for the for anybody interested out there on crocheting, mm -hmm. and maybe that way they can they can um, have some positive. Something to do for calming. That's what I use yes. for therapy. <clears throat> so uh, I think the biggest impact that I saw when I came in was the number of children. It was just amazing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, each house had different sizes, and it was so. There's a lot going on there. So, uh, anyways, keep them in your prayers. Well. And, uh, anyways, I just want to say thank you. It was a wonderful success and. I haven't seen the picture yet. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Well, some of you know that I've struggled with uh, minor health things for about a month now. And, and Linda Bartle called me the other night and prayed with me and for me. I almost wanted to call her the next day because I was feeling so much better. And <laughs> appreciate the prayers of God's people and appreciate her calling me and giving me that support. God is good. And we're celebrating him and giving him glory today for all of his goodness. And then John David in the middle, of, I don't know if it's the middle of the week, sometime during the week, I'm, I'm preparing for camp. I have a weekend of revival in Port Natchez. The Friday I preach, Saturday morning I taught. I met with uh, someone at the Dream Center in Beaumont. Uh, I met with a couple that was in crisis. And during this pr week of preparation, he communicated with me and said, hey, if you want me to preach on Sunday, that would take some of the pressure off of you. I'm ready to do it. And I said, John David, let me pray about it. But I didn't have to pray long. And God said, take him up on that. <laughs> and so I am so thankful for his support and uh, the way he holds my arms up. And it's uh, just the maturity and the the depth that he has and and the. Uh, Asia, we just love y'all. And so I'm thankful for him today. Y'all know what happens? I'm this way anyway. But when I'm, <laughs> when I'm tired, the waterworks really turn on. So y'all have to pray for me because we got a lot of emotional, wonderful things going on. Do y'all have prayer needs? If anyone has a specific need, we're not going to ask you to say what it is. But would you stand? We're going to pray for you. We're going to publish your name in an email. All right. Let's let's pray. Father, thank you for these who are standing. They believe in you. They know you've said we have not because we ask not. 
We also know that we're not standing asking for our will to have it used for our flesh. We're standing asking for your will, that it will be what's best for your kingdom, what you're teaching us, what you're bringing us through, how you're using everything. And Father, some are praying for somebody else. Some are praying for healing of themselves or a loved one. Some are under unusual stress and pressure. We, we pray for them. And Father, we know uh, David Mayers is going through something right now, but he's here. We're thankful for him. Uh, we are in our spirits laying hands on him today. And we just pray for all the needs and that your will be done. And we do. We bring you and give you what you so richly deserve. All the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. We're not going to sing yet. Not Kevin's turn yet. <laughs> He's on pins and needles. He's wondering when it's, when it's his time. It's soon. But I want to ask Zane if he would come up here. Zane Cowan, finish your coffee or whatever you're drinking. <laughs> I guess I better come over here because some people are watching via Zoom. So we'll let them in, enjoy seeing Zane this morning. Yeah, we're very proud of him. I mentioned that this morning when we had some snacks in his honor. He's a graduating senior. He also not too long ago became an Eagle Scout. Some of us got to enjoy that with him. Uh, he's been accepted into college. Where are you going? Tarleton State. Tarleton State. He's going to Tarleton. And so he's got a lot of great things ahead of him. We are so proud of him. And he represents our church. I couldn't even talk to his dad today because he's got my same affliction <laughs> as he's seeing his son grow up and leave the nest. He's, uh, he said he's losing his best friend. I assured him he's not losing him, that he will be there. May not seem as much, but we're presenting him with this Bible from our church. And it says it's presented to Zane Cowan by Bethel Methodist Church of the Hill Country on May 30th, 2021. I got all that right, I hope. <laughs> And then this is what I wrote. Two roads diverged in a wood, and, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. The words of Robert Frost in that famous poem are very true when applied to the narrow way of Holy Scripture. Take the path of God's Word. It leads to heaven through faith in Jesus Christ. Your church is praying for you, and we are very proud of you, Pastor Jerry. Amen. God bless you. You can say something if you want to. Uh, oh, you're Thank you. <laughs> he said something. I'm so thankful. I tell you, he can make a speech if he wants to, and uh, that was it. Thank you. I love it. Man, a few words right to the point. Thank you, Zane. Now, we are so blessed to, I'm blessed to have uh, gotten a new friend, a new brother in Christ. Uh, he called me on the phone a while back, and we got to talk, and I was uh, impressed with his heart and his spirit then. I got to see him last night, have some good homemade soup at the Parker's, and one of the best apple, the best apple pie, maybe I better be careful because my <laughs> wife's here, one of the top two apple pies I've ever had in my life last night. <laughs> okay. I just hate I missed it. Yeah, me too. Uh, I'd warned my my wife and her sister out. So they, they rested while I went on to the Parker's house and we had a great time of fellowship. And uh, he, was, he was one to Christ, and he'll correct me if I'm wrong, by some Americans that were there for Sport Quest. And he wants to tell you about that. And so pray for this young man. As he talked about his heart and the possibility down the road, he may be a pastor someday. I said, maybe in Texas. How about that? <laughs> Well, I know he'll just follow the Lord wherever he leads. So, Kevin, if you want to come, I'll be thank God for you. I have some stuff. I have some stuff, you know. <laughs> Get ready. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> First of all, thank you, Pastor Jerry. You know, you've been such an example of what, you know, what it looks like, you know, to be a brother. You know, just 
for me coming from a far, far place to just to come to meet you on the phone or just meeting you and just taking the time after a long trip to come to us and okay, we ate some soup and we ate some pie, but still to, to take the time to, you know, just to, to come hear my heart and for me to experience your heart was very special. Um, also want to thank you so much for your warm, warm welcome. Um, I know Dwayne and Vicky, you know, they have experienced the same thing when they came here for the first time, just to experience the, the genuine welcome of a church family. And I have experienced that the same thing. I, I was just telling, you know, Papa, I was just <laughs> telling him, like, I don't know what to do. I'm like, I'm just so overwhelmed by so many, you know, smiling faces and, you know, w w welcoming people. So I'm like, OK, uh, I'm no normally pretty introvert. You know, I'm trying to you know keep my distance, but. <laughs> I do have some really cool things to share with you. So I'm going to get this here going. So I keep on track because I want to give John David a chance as well. <laughs> Hello, I'm Kevin Verstraten. Um, I'm glad you didn't try that. That was, that was tough, you know. It's, man, it's been butchered over many years. Um, it's all right. I'm 34 years old, I'm born and raised in Belgium, Europe. Um, but I met my wife here in the States in Indianapolis. Her name is Jenny. She's momentarily with our lovely two young children in Florida with her parents and sisters. It was just too much of a drive, too much of a trip to do all together. Um, they came up with, with us to Indianapolis and then flew from there. And I took this extensive road trip, you know, from Indianapolis through Missouri, through Oklahoma and Kansas, and then finally come to Texas. And it's been absolutely a roller coaster, but man, God has been with me and he has shown up in so many different ways. Um, and I want to share you a, a little bit of my story, but before I do that, I do want to congratulate you guys because you did it. Not just Zane, because he did something, you know, very significant as well, but you did it. Probably you have no idea what I'm talking about, right? Um, let me explain to you what I'm talking about. Um, I took a book. Who knows this book? Raise your hand, please. I see a lot of hands. Who does not know this book? Okay, you do not know this book. Come on. Okay, well, 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 I know, but Vivi behind her, like my own grandma. <laughs> so this is Where's Waldo? And Where's Waldo is a really fun little thing that my brothers and I did when we was younger. So you basically find this guy, Waldo, in like these maps. Like, so you kind of go through a map and you have to find this little guy and you know on one of these pages it's actually really fun you know it's really cool to do and you know my kids will enjoy it for many many years but let me tell you um, you have found Waldo <laughs> I might have had like the, I might have a different shirt on the glasses like we didn't need a hat but it but <laughs> I tried the, the whole ensemble, but it just doesn't always work that quite way. But you did find Waldo, and let me explain to you what that means to me. So um, just in reality, like, like if you open one of these pages, like say this is like the beach page, you know, if you kind of count all the people, say if we get to like 100 people, there's only one Waldo, right? You have to find the one guy. And this is what it is for a person in Belgium to be a Christian. So at this moment, in reality, if you do like, if you look at the surveys, one person in Belgium out of a hundred will tell you that they are a newborn believer in Christ. So in Belgium, you can rename where's Waldo to where's the Christian. We don't always wear this kind of outfit, but um, it will give you a better understanding of where my story is coming from. So first of all, I was born and raised in a non-Christian family, more nominally Catholic, you know, just like many people in our country. You know, we did have like the Catholic school and we did go to church on Easter and Christmas more because we wanted to, you know, please the grandparents than just to get the gifts afterwards. You know, that's kind of what we did. Um, but I did come from a broken family. My mom and dad got divorced when I was six. And my mom took my two brothers and I, and we left um, that city and we moved to a different one. Living in a single family household was, you know, like we just didn't ever have much. You know, we, we always had to fight kind of for what we had. And for me, it was really tough to find my identity in something I really wanted to do or what I had, you know. 
until I found basketball. Obviously, I'm a little taller, but I wasn't always this tall. But basketball, for me, gave me what I needed at that time. It gave me a feeling of identity, of passion, a purpose, a sense of belonging, and it filled the hole in my heart that I had at that time. I wanted to be good so bad that I would do anything, you know, to get better. Most of the camps that were in Belgium, you know, they cost a lot of money, especially the ones with American coaches, because Americans just do this game the best. It's just what it is. You can be proud of that. Um, but in the summer that I, you know, I was 16 years old, my life completely changed because a friend that was on my basketball team invited me to a camp called Sport Quest. This was a free basketball camp in my own city, so I didn't have to travel. And it was ran by American student athletes. I'm like, no way, you know, like, what, what's the deal? Like, I pay hundreds and hundreds of dollars for these camps for one American coach. And now you're telling me there's a free camp with dozens of them. And he said, yes, just come and show up. So skeptically, you know, I, I joined and, you know, within the first five minutes, I received, you know, like 10 high fives, you know, just... It was amazing. From the moment I walked in here, it was kind of the same feeling as what I did when I walked into camp when I was 16. Kind of shy, like still kind of seeing who it all was, but just the warm enthusiasm and passion of these wonderful American athletes. It was amazing. But my, uh, my focus turned really quickly. So I was welcomed. Now I'm going to prove myself to these American athletes, right? You know, I really worked extremely hard and, you know, did my absolute best. And on the second day of camp, one of the leaders of the camp actually gave me an award. Like, um, so this guy was also from, from Texas. He was from Lubbock, Texas, and gave me one of his high school t-shirts as an award. This award, until this day, and I've had some success in basketball in Belgium, still holds the, you know, the best prize that I've ever received in basketball. That that t-shirt has more, more holes in it now from washing it over and over again that eventually I just had to get rid of it. There was no more saving there. But it just really meant that, you know, first of all, I was worth something. And second of all, it just meant like, wow, like, like, yeah, like the relationship is being built right here with this young man. So we just kind of connected and just kind of kept on talking. But the special thing about this camp that I've never experienced was that they were just constantly talking about God and Jesus and having a relationship with Jesus. You know, they would share testimonies. They would, you know, just in individual relationships would kind of constantly touch on that. And I was like, that's very weird to me, you know, because that's not what I kind of grew and learned about. But it was very intriguing to me. The last day of camp... They all lined up, you know, we were kind of wrapping up the camp and that's when they shared the gospel to me for the first time. Never heard it, like presented that way. And they asked, like, if you want to know more, come join us up here, you know, have a conversation. So introverted and shy that I was, I just kind of waited for somebody else to go and to kind of pray, like, please let somebody go so I can as well. And somebody did. So I joined as well. And I talked to my friend and got invited to a church there in Belgium. And yeah, th my life kind of started, you know, rotating in a very positive way. I'm like, this is, this is really cool. Until October hit, you know, so obviously a couple months later, I'm doing really well. I got a really good, you know, I'm doing well in school. I'm doing well in basketball. And then on a, you know, Saturday morning in October, um, first minute of basketball game, I kind of stumbled over something, hyperextended my elbow and got like some nerve damage as well lost the mobility in my hand. So like, even though I had sensation in it still, I lost the mobility. And the only thing for months that I could think about is like, why, oh Lord, are you doing this to me? Me that stepped out, wanted to know more about you, wanted to know Jesus, you know, like, what are you doing to me? You know, come on. So for months, you know, I didn't go to church much. You know, I was really angry. I just didn't really know how to place it. Until um, I found out that SportQuest was sending a new team to our church in Yank. So I decided to, like, I need to be part of this team. And this is, you know, they accepted me for, I was like, okay, well, this is great. They accepted me. I was allowed to come. And this is where my life completely took a 180 turn. Because first of all, I got my Bible in my own language. You know, I did not have a Bible. I, like, I had like a sports New Testament in English just didn't really connect as well. 
Um, but second of all, I got to learn to apply this Bible. I got to learn to see the truths in the Bible for myself. We got to do worship. We got to do prayer. And, and here's the big thing. I talked to you about the one out of a hundred thing. So for seven days, I was completely away from all the distractions that the world was bringing me. And it gave me seven days to be completely immersed with what God was doing in my life and my heart. And it changed my life. It changed my life completely. I gave my life to the Lord completely there in 2004. And everything really changed from there. You know, I started not just seeing his blessing, but I wanted to walk in his blessing. I wanted to follow him. I read my whole Bible, got baptized the next year. And every year I would go on these, on these sports mission trips, right? So we would take basketball as a way to, you know, bring glory to Christ. You know, I wanted to proclaim his gospel. In 2010, um, I got the opportunity to come here to the States. So Sport Quest is an American organization. So they have their headquarters or had in Indianapolis and I was offered an internship. So I prayed about it. I actually gave up my job that I was doing at the time in Belgium and got to go. I said like, I'm going to take this originally for one year. I was going to be here for a year and then go back. Well, Lord had a different plan for me. <laughs> I, um, I came on a Sunday night. The next Sunday morning, I met my wife. <laughs> I was praying that week, like, Lord, don't bring a wife on my path. But he clearly had different ideas. I met Jenny, and not too much later, I met you guys as well. And it was just so special to be welcomed into this new family. We got married in February the next year, and we started our mission together, you know, as a couple. And... Um, started being a missionary in, in America, started raising support, started raising, you know, you know, whatever we needed to do. Um, I kind of felt like it was like a, a commissioning time where I was learning and being mentored and being equipped to do this kind of work, you know, for a longer time. Um, in this time as well, I really grew passionate about becoming an American. You know, and this, this yeah, Memorial Day is something that, you know, I consider very dear to me because like I really wanted to become an American, not just so I can move back to Belgium without any conditions and stuff, but I just really felt like, you know, this is my second home. This is like where I belong. And I do recognize that, you know, this is a country that God is still in the center. So Belgium does allow dual citizenship and it gave us the opportunity to, in 2016, move back to Belgium. Um, and to do, you know, gospel work right there. It's still a very difficult country, you know, very secular country, very socialistic country. So a lot of things are, we have to, you know, yeah, you have to move an elephant sometimes to get things done. But, you know, it's just so amazed that the boy that came out of Belgium in 2010 was equipped, became a man, and now, now is like giving back, you know, to the church, to the local mission, but also to the European mission. And it's just so amazing. Now, let me speak to you, church. I might have come thousands of miles, really. Like, I'm probably the furthest away from everybody here. But um, the thing is, our mission is the same. We are called to make disciples of all nations. So right here in Canyon Lake, you know, like Hills Country, you know, like first time for me to be here. But, you know, this place is precious in the eyes of the Lord just as much as Belgium is. But there is still work to be done. I think, you know, this place can definitely add a lot of people. You know, we can do this. So let's just join together in this mission. And that is every day put on the armor of God. This kind of feels like that, you know, like where we stand together, you know, to, to fight the, the battle that we are in. But like, and we talked about it in Sunday school, even, you know, a tribulation is still a tribulation, whether you're, you know, actually facing, you know, physically harm or otherwise, you know, it's just what it is. But the thing is, we are one strong family and we need to stand together. You know, whether I am in Belgium or here, you know, I feel that the sensation of family is still really, really evident. Second of all, I want to challenge you to pray for me, my family, my brothers and sisters in Christ, because the harvest field awaits us. It is amazing, but we just need more workers. You know, we need to be workers to be equipped. So for me, that is my prayer to you as well. I know that you guys are doing a mighty work and the harvest fields awaits. We just got to keep, keep the hand on the plow. And lastly, let me tell you that even though our mission sometimes feels too much to bear, we are already coming from a victorious spot. You know, the Lord has already won this battle. We are more than conquerors through him that who loved us. So hold tight to the Lord and don't let go. 
because that is the only way we'll be victorious. So church, you know, a special blessing to you this morning. I'm very excited what you have for us, John David. And like, I hope that, you know, we can find some time after church or something to talk a little bit more about Belgium and whatever we have. But I'm just so blessed to be here. And thank you so much for this morning. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, brother. And uh, always, uh, I'm always amazed, I shouldn't be, that when I meet somebody who truly loves the Lord, he's family, yeah. whether he's from Belgium or wherever they're from. And so we thank God for you. And, and I want us to have a special offering. We're going to do, I didn't warn the ushers, all the stuff I've had on my mind. We're going to take an offering for this ministry to support Kevin and what he's doing and sharing the gospel. Sport, sport, sport Quest, sport. yes. If you want to write a check, would it be to Sport Quest? If you want the tax write up for sure. Okay. <laughs> and you can, you can always find me afterwards. If there, I got some booklets and some cards as well to help people to understand that a little bit more. We're going to ask him to hang out wherever he finds the most comfortable place in the building. Uh, he's going to hang out and y'all can ask him questions and talk to him more about this. Uh, but we want to ask the ushers to come. We're going to first take a mission offering. Now, if you planned on giving to the church today, I know Dennis and all the rest of us would say still do that. <laughs> but we're asking for anything extra above and beyond that it be given to this ministry. If you feel led to do that. And so we're going to pray and then we'll take a mission offering. And then we want you guys to come back after that and we're going to take our regular offering. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Kevin. I, I've known him only a short time, but I sense that family connection. And I pray that you would bless him. I thank you that he's interested in learning uh, from me. I'm interested in learning from him. And I pray that this relationship uh, that was obviously orchestrated by you, uh, would be uh, fruitful in our lives, this church's life, the mission for your kingdom, most importantly. So bless those who give to this work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. church that's always the priority that's not me as pastor being selfish that's uh, what we have to do we have to take care of the family and we have to take care of the, our local church and our own family and then you start looking for opportunities beyond that which uh, when our church is growing and maturing in the things of God I see an interest in not just me being fed. And Kevin, we talked about that last night. He said for years, he just was a sponge. He received, he received, he received. And now he's at that place where he wants to give back to the kingdom of God. And, and that's what I see our church beginning to be more mature and wanting to give instead of just receive. And that's a blessing when you see that happening. So as soon as the ushers are ready, we want you to come back. Oh, you're doing the regular offering. Thank you. <laughs> Great job. You are efficient. <laughs> Go ahead, Gene. Thank you.
Amen. Let's sing the doxology. Let's stand. You may be seated. Thank you. John David and his love for God's truth and the ability that God has given him to preach the word. And so I know he can't do it without God. So we're praying for you and thanking God for you. Good morning, church family. It's good to see you all here. As pastor said, Memorial Day weekend, you are here. Mm. May we remember those who have sacrificed their lives for our freedom to be able to gather here today where we can preach the word of God freely. And ultimately, remember Christ, the one who gave his life 
so that we can be here. This morning, as uh, me and my family were getting in the van, um, it's a it's a task now to, to herd all the kids and get them into the van. And uh, as we're getting in there to drive to church, Matilda says, Daddy, are you preaching this morning? I said, I said, yes. She said, if there's any way, can it be a short preach so we're not there too long? Now, by any chance, if there's anyone here today that has that hope, <laughs> have to give you the same response that I gave to Matilda. I said, I will preach until the Lord leads me to stop. So if you brought your Bibles, let's go ahead and open up to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17. The sermon this morning is titled, Drink from the Rock. Drink from the Rock. I pray that our souls can be quenched, the spiritual thirst that is there, that we drink from the rock. Before we read the scriptures, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we need you. We need you, God. You do a mighty work in our service this morning. You are the one that we are here to worship, Lord. Allow you to be high and lifted up in your word, Father, where we can cast aside any distraction and focus on you, Lord. Worship you in spirit and truth, God, as you tell us in John chapter 4. Lord, please, Lord, it's not in the wisdom of words, but the power of your spirit. Have your way this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Pardon me as I take a sip of water. <clears throat> Exodus 17, beginning at verse 1. Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, go on before the people and take with you some elders of Israel. Also in your hand, your rod with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb and you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the contention of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? This morning, we're going to be examining the biblical account in which Moses strikes the rock and God miraculously provides water for his children. I pray that as we examine this text this morning, that we can be able to see God, that we can know him, that we can see his grace, his mercy, his love, his holiness, his justice, all the things that he desires to communicate about himself in his word. Now, while this is a miracle that is awesome to behold and sing, it is of great importance to us as the church today in understanding the text. This is a prophetic picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ that was delivered thousands of years before his first coming. And I pray that we understand it as we see it and that we can rest in the message of the gospel that our Lord desires us to hear. Now, as we work our way through the text this morning, there are three main points that I want us to be able to see. For those of you who are note takers, point number one is the thirst, the thirst, or you can title that the need, the need. Point number two this morning is going to be the cry, the cry or man's response. You can title that. And point number three, the stricken rock, 
the stricken rock. God's provision. God's provision. Now, for anyone who is unfamiliar with the book of Exodus, the title Exodus literally means mass departure, mass departure. And this book encapsulates the story of the mass departure of God's people in bondage and slavery in Egypt to bring them into the wilderness where they will begin their journey toward the promised land, where God would form them as a nation and eventually bring about the Savior of the world, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ, who opened the way of salvation for all. And in this book, there are many miracles that our Lord shows us inside of here. We see early on the 10 plagues that God brought on Egypt. We also see the parting of the Red Sea. We even see in the previous chapter two this manna from heaven, God giving bread, God feeding his people in the wilderness when there was no food around them for their survival. And as we come to chapter 17, we see this miracle of Moses striking the rock and God providing water for his people. Now, please understand this before we advance in the scriptures. When God does miracles in the Bible, he does not just do miracles for the sake of doing miracles. He always does miracles for the sake of communicating truth about who he is and what he is doing for all eternity. And he desires us to be able to see those truths. And we see that here in the scripture this morning. Allow us to go ahead and proceed into verse one. Then all of the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Now, please understand this, this picture. This is just not a few people that came out of Egypt and are now inside of the wilderness. We are talking about a whole nation, approximately two million people, two million people coming into the wilderness. That is the equivalent today of San Antonio deciding to one day pick up their belongings and walk to El Paso. You are not going to get there unless God is with you. God is doing this. God was wanting to take this people to bring about his son, Jesus Christ. And he brings them through the wilderness and already, you know, parting the Red Sea and providing food for them. And this is early on in their journey. They haven't been wandering for 40 years yet. They are, if you will, baby believers at this point. God hand holding them through the wilderness to teach them how to depend on him for everything they need the same way that God desires us to as when we are born again we are spiritual babies that the Lord is going to be faithful to and providing for and to help us and so there is much for us to be able to get out of this now as this two million people are coming through the wilderness it said that they camped in Rephidim which in the Hebrew the name Rephidim literally means to rest or resting place and so they, they're coming and it's as if we're on the highway and we see a sign that says resting area ahead. You would have expectations in your flesh that you would be able to rest there. That what you needed would be provided there. But as they got there, there was no water. They were in a dire circumstance. Two million people in a desert, no water. You cannot live more than three days physically without water. They were going to die unless God intervenes. Now, when we find ourselves in a circumstance where you need God, you have two options inside of your life. One, you can look to God. You can call out to him. You can say, God, help me and wait for him to meet the need. Only he could meet the need. Or you have a second option. You can be able to only look down at this lower physical reality, the circumstances that are before you in which there is no hope in sight unless God intervenes. How does the children of Israel respond? Verse two, 
Therefore, the people contended with Moses and said, give us water that we may drink. Rather than calling on God, the one who has already took them through the Red Sea and provided manna for them in the desert to feed them, rather than saying, God, we need water, they instead look to man. They look to man to be able to provide for them something that only God can provide for them. They said, Moses, give us water. They contended with him. Moses, you brought us here. This is your fault. Give us water before we die. May we never idolize leadership or men and put God in the put man in the place of God. Man can and will fail you, but God never will. God is true to his name. He is faithful to his name and what he has promised in his word. Let us call on him. Moses said to them, why do you contend? Why do you tempt the Lord? How do they tempt the Lord? Verse 7 tells us, they said, is the Lord among us or not? They were completely not living by faith. It was in doubt. They were not looking to God. They were not trusting God. They were in question of God. Is God even real? Even though he has done all these mighty miracles to bring us to the place where we are at, they were in a place of doubt. Verse 3. And the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Now they were in a real situation. They needed water. You know, I, I don't think from a physical circumstance, their reaction is something that we should criticize the Israelites over. Yes, they needed to respond by faith, but we have never been inside of these types of circumstances. And especially as new believers at this point, it was very serious and they complained. They would have rather been back in bondage in Egypt where they were at least alive or at least they thought they were alive rather than being in their current circumstance, which this brings me to my first point, the thirst, the thirst, the need. We must understand that God, this is a fundamental physical truth. God designed man to have physical thirst. It is the way he designed your body. It is your body's reaction saying, I need something. I need this water that is going to keep me alive. Again, you cannot live more than three days without water. You need to be hydrated. Dehydration will kill you. It is a physical need for life. And God gave us a gift of thirst to let us know you're thirsty where I right now my mouth is parched so I can <laughs> swish it around and take a sip. <laughs> Thank God for that. But we don't just stop at the physical reality. God gave us this physical reality to communicate a spiritual truth. There is a spiritual thirst that he has given to all mankind. All of us. You see, God created your heart, your spirit. He created you in the image of God to be able to have a relationship with him to where his Holy Spirit can dwell inside of your spirit and you have life inside of him. Going back to the garden and Adam, when Adam sinned and the Holy Spirit departed from man, man's heart now in a state of sin is in great desperation to try to fill it with all sorts of other things to try to satisfy that spiritual thirst that man, that God has given to man. But yet they can not unless they are restored to a right relationship with God for that Holy Spirit can come back inside of them and give them what they need. Our Lord Jesus in, God, in the Gospel of John chapter 4, when he is talking to the woman by the well, as she is coming to work her daily routine of getting water out of this well, Jesus says to her, of this water, this physical water, you will thirst again. 
But of the water that I shall give you, you will never thirst, he said. This will be inside of you as a well springing up into everlasting life. It will be an ongoing source that will always satisfy as long as you are abiding in Christ in your relationship with him. He says you will never thirst. Can you spiritually thirst again? If you are not abiding in Christ, you are not connected to the source of life and that spiritual thirst will come back. I pray that if we are thirsty, we will drink this morning from the spiritual source God desires to give to us. Verse four. So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, what shall I do? What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. Now, before we move on to seeing how God provides to see his provision through the stricken rock, I do not want us to just move over this. We need to stop, which brings me to the second point, the cry. Moses cried out to the Lord. It is true. God desires to meet the needs of the cries of his children. It is the same way I thank God that God has given my son Obadiah, not even one years old yet, the ability to cry out when he is hungry so that I, his father, can come and meet the need the same way my heavenly father seeks to meet the need inside of my life. May we cry out to the Lord. God desires his people to pray. God desires his people to call out to him. He has designed it to be a relationship. We are not a bunch of puppets that he is just moving little chess pieces. Yes, he is active in the work of his church, but he desires your mind. He desires your heart to willingly come to him and call out to him. And in this situation, Moses cried out to the Lord. Now, yes, this was a life threatening situation in which Moses was fearing for his life, that he was going to be stoned by these people in a mob-like mentality because of their current circumstances. It was a real danger that Moses faced, but yet he cried out to the Lord. Our Lord tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, cast your cares upon him for he cares for you. The Bible tells us that the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. There are many things I know that you want to see God do inside of this life. Loved ones that you want to see come to repentance and faith and come to know Jesus and be saved for eternity. There are people that you know who are being destroyed by the effects of sin. There are still life-threatening circumstances that are among us that we should cry out to the Lord today. Do not think you are too mature or too civilized to be able to call out to God. We need to call out to him in great desperation if we ever want to see revival inside of this land. May we be like Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1 as she was struggling with barrenness of the womb that the Bible says that she prayed and the Bible says that she poured out her soul. May that be our heart that we can come to him. Moses cried out to the Lord. Now to let us see how God met the need. Verse five. And the Lord said to Moses. Now, stop there. One, one thing I just want to back up and say in Moses cry. He said, what shall I do? What shall I do? He was looking for wisdom. Anytime you cry out to the Lord and you are looking to God, what do I do? Remember the Bible promises in James chapter one that any of you who lacks wisdom ask and it will be given to you. God desires to show his will for your life and for us to be able to respond for it. We have not because we ask not. Let us call on him and Moses called on him. And so God was faithful and starts to give Moses instruction. He says, go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand, your rod with which you struck the river and go. Please note that is God told Moses to go to take some of the elders with him. God desires us to never go alone. 
He desires us to have genuine Christian fellowship, camaraderie, as we are being able to seek first the kingdom of God and serve him. He desires us to be connected to others. He sent out his disciples two by two. Do not think you were called to go alone. God told Moses, take some of the elders with you and now go. Take your rod and your hand, the rod in which you struck the river and go. Now, before we see what Moses does with striking the rock, I want us to pause on the rod for a moment because this is very important in the picture for us to be able to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ as it is communicated in the Old Testament here. You see, in the Bible, a rod, a rod symbolizes authority and power. We see in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, Christ reigning with a rod of iron, not an iron fist, but a rod of iron. It is to symbolize his power, his authority, all his attributes working together harmoniously to accomplish his will, the true sovereignty of God, if you will. Not a false one that paints the picture like an iron fist but a rod of iron. This was the same rod in which God told Moses, throw it to the ground and it turned into a serpent. It is the same one as he says right here, strike the river, the one in which you struck the river. This is a reference to the first plague inside of the 10 plagues in which Moses struck the river and it turned into blood, killing all of the animals inside of there. This was a picture of God's judgment, his power and wrath towards sin being poured out. This rod is the same rod in which is called the rod of God later. And there are multiple other things in which God does with this rod, with Moses. But it is a symbol. This is not a magic stick that Moses has. He's not going it around to be able to wield for himself whatever he wants. God forbid that we take the things of God and turn it into something for us. It is for him to be glorified. And that was his intention with this rod that he used to always symbolize God at work with them. And we should take comfort in it. As Psalm 23 says, as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil for your rod and your staff. They comfort me. I can take comfort in knowing that I am trusting in the one who upholds the entire universe. May you do the same. Take your rod and go, he tells Moses. Verse six, behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb and you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So we have Moses being instructed by God to go and take your rod and strike this water. The water may come out and the people may drink. Now, this is a miracle. We are talking about two million people who need enough water to live in a wilderness where there is no water. Only God can be able to meet this need. Let us just take that in, seeing God's power at work to meet the needs of his children. But let us move past that. Let us see deeper. What is God wanting to show about himself? We see the gospel of Jesus Christ here. I pray that we see it while we've already communicated the rod. This is the father and his power and his authority and what he is desiring. He is telling Moses, strike the rock. Now, please understand the rock. What does it symbolize? It symbolizes Christ, Jesus Christ himself. Inside of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, it said they all drank of the spiritual drink of the rock. And he says specifically that rock was Christ. This isn't something John David is just making up out of the scriptures right here. This is something the Bible corroborates for itself, saying that the rock was Christ. And God, the Father, instructed him to strike the rock, that the water may come flowing out of it, that the people may drink. The water symbolizes the Holy Spirit. 
In the Gospel of John, chapter 7, our Lord tells us, he said, if anyone thirsts, come to me and I will give you a drink. If you have believed on me, as the scriptures have said, out of your heart will flow rivers of living water. And it says, and Jesus said this concerning the Holy Spirit. We see the triune God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit at work to be able to provide the needs for his children to give them life. That is the heart of God as he has created you for the purpose to be able to have a love relationship with him. But yet sin stands in the way. Sin must be judged in order that you can be able to come and drink from the rock. Jesus was struck by the Father. If you will, hold your place right there. We're going to come right back to close out at verse 7. But I want us to turn over to Isaiah 53 real quick. Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 6. I'll give you a moment to get there. And as you're turning there, the prophet Isaiah is a prophet that was sent to Judah and Jerusalem in a time of great backsliding to preach to them the judgment for sin, much like what we see in America today. We need prophets to rise up and preach the word to people that they may repent. In the second half of the book of Isaiah, we have much more prophecies of hope then of just judgment. And in Isaiah 53, we have a prophecy in which is Christ himself and his first coming. This is given 700 years before Christ came. Verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Nobody knows your pain and what you are going through in this life more than Jesus. He who knew no sin became sin on the cross. Any type of affliction, he has tasted it and he he knows he is someone who cares for you and he does not hold it lightly. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was smitten by God. It says, yet we esteemed him stricken. That means we handed him over to be smitten by God. Now, please note this word smitten in the Hebrew here is the word nakah. Nakah. It is the same word used in Exodus 17, where Moses is instructed to strike the rock. It is the word meaning to strike, to kill, to slay, to strike with the intention to kill. When we go back to Exodus 17, Moses instructed to strike the rock, was not come over there and just tap the rock and water came, does not tap water. No, he struck the rock with the intention to kill. In the same way, the heavenly father struck his only begotten son who paid his life so that we can be saved. Verse five, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him for our peace with him. He endured all of this. And by his stripes, we are healed. We are restored to a relationship with God where his Holy Spirit is in us. And we are right and holy in his eyes. Again, in abiding relationship. Verse six, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. There was no other person to be able to come, but Christ he came as a real man to pay the price for our sin. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Everyone in this room is guilty. The iniquity of us all. God the Father took out his wrath for sin on his son. He laid on him the iniquity of us all, not just a select few people, but the sins of the entire world that if we come to repentance and faith through who he is and what he has done on this cross, we may be forgiven and restored to a right relationship with him, able to drink of the water that he desires to give you to satisfy your soul, to quench the spiritual thirst that your heart was was created for. Do not be deceived in this world thinking there is anything out there that will satisfy. Only drinking from the rock, drinking from Christ. Will you be satisfied? There is nothing else. 
Back in Exodus 17, verse 7. Moses did this mighty thing where the Lord performed a miracle. The people had water. They were able to survive. Verse 7, so he called the name of the place Massa, meaning tempted, and Meribah, meaning contention, because of the contention of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? Today, as we are closing out, I will ask you the same question. Is the Lord among us? Or not? Is that real to you as the Lord among us? He is here. He is the omnipresent God. His Holy Spirit is in this room today. He is, and I pray that we can see him through the eyes of faith. But I challenge you not to be like Moses. See, Moses, Moses didn't make it into the promised land. In Numbers chapter 20, there's a second encounter which Moses is instructed to go to the rock to get water, but this time to speak to the rock rather than striking the rock. And there's a whole nother message in there that uh, the Lord is teaching me that I would, Lord willing, like to share one day. I told the people in poor nature, so they have me back. That's where we would go. <sighs> Moses did not make it. Moses did not. He had... Great issues with the people because of the contention and temptation and this situation. He, it says, he named the place, not God. He named the place contention and temptation. This is what he recorded in this event. Rather than seeing what God had done and giving him glory to the original name of the place, which is Rephidim, to rest we cannot allow a root of bitterness to swell up inside of our hearts just because of things that we may encounter with our brothers and sisters in Christ. God does not desire that. He desires refidim for you. He desires you to be able to drink from the rock and be satisfied where all of that can be washed away and we be with him forever and eternity. Let's go ahead and sing our invitational hymn this morning. I invite you to come to this altar and pray if there is anything that you would like to pray about, anything. Whether or not you have never tasted of this rock and would like to call out to God, I will call out to God with you. If you need to pray about anything in your life and you would like to just be left alone, I will leave you alone as well. This altar is open.
God has answered our prayers today. And uh, I know my prayer is the same as John David. Let me decrease and let him increase. I know that's Kevin. He's got a big nod going yes, too. So remember, Kevin's going to be here and visit with him if you if you want to. And uh, just thank you, Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for John David, the instrument that he is for you. And uh, as our true attitude is for us to decrease, then you do increase. And I thank you for that today. Thank you for uh, John David's humility and willingness to be used of you. I just rejoice in that. And just thank you that he's yours. Thank you for the message that you brought through him. Thank you for the blessing it was to me. Thank you for the blessing it was for your heart, more importantly. And we just thank you for this time together. It's been precious. We pray that it, what has transpired here by your Holy Spirit would permeate our weekend as we celebrate. May we not indulge the flesh May we look to you and give you thanks and praise for all the blessings, including the good food and the family and whatever we're going to be doing. We thank you that you satisfy and that you have given us this great land. And we thank of those who have made it possible by giving their lives. But more importantly, we thank you for Jesus who gave his life voluntarily. Father, he became all that you needed him to be. And then you struck the rock. May we speak to the rock. May we receive it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.